How's it going, everybody? My name is Nabil Sarwar. I'm one of the leading engineers in Comcast NBC Universal. I work in building end-to-end -end, uh, data pipelines, starting from data ingest to feature engineering to model deployment, monitoring, and feedback loops. In this presentation, I'm going to go over uh, pretty much an encyclopedia of all the techniques I know within feature engineering. Uh, these things won't be specific to Spark, but I think that Spark definitely makes it a lot easier. Uh, some of the things that aren't in Spark I'll make explicit. And uh, let's begin. Uh, so to give you some context about what Comcast does, because I'm sure not all of you guys are American, it's pretty much a broadband company, uh, very much like Ireland Sky. We provide internet, video, media, mobile services, uh, some home security as well, and voice. We have around 25 million customers using some combination of these services, whether it's only one or all of them. So there's a lot of data coming in. And pretty much in this realm, we're trying to use machine learning to optimize customer experience at all levels, uh, while maintaining to privacy and all that stuff. To give a quick overview of kind of what Comcast does in my space, uh, it's all the way on the left on the Comcast cable side, uh, focusing on the broadband, but Comcast, oh, I guess the full screen changed it. But we also own Parks, own Hulu and BuzzFeed and a few other things. So where in the machine learning process are we? So we're right there in the middle, but to give you some more context, you of course need to define your problem, obtain your data, which is not always so trivial as I make it seem right now. Then you go into the selecting, cleaning, and transformation of your data. Um, and then you ideally, ideally go into model selection, tuning, and evaluation, and close it all with a feedback loop to let you know when your model's drifting, when you need to retrain, or when you just need to shut down because your operation is not performing to what you expected. Uh, one thing I want to make clear is that this process is not as linear as I make it seem. You should imagine arrows going every which way from the definition step to the tuning evaluation step, from selecting and cleaning. Not everything will happen in this order because you might need to backtrack and really redefine your assumptions, obtain more data, change your problem if you ended up reading the wrong use case. Uh, sometimes the models you think we're performing, we're going to perform, don't perform, so you need to change how you do your transformations. Uh, so it's a very iterative process, and even once you have it all in production, you might need to do uh, some more uh, iterative feedback. So I hope in this uh, presentation, if you're a beginner, you'll have a cheat sheet to pretty much some of the best practices and things that people have forgotten. If you're in the intermediate to like advanced stage of data science, I hope that uh, you get a quick refresher or maybe learn some things you didn't know. Uh, hopefully you'll know, understand a little bit more why feature engineering is necessary, how you exactly do it, and how you measure your success, uh, the pr variations in the process, uh, while focusing on the selecting, cleaning, and transformation of these features. And I'm going to try to impart, uh, impart on, on you some of my philosophies about whether you should go upon confirming your hypothesis when selecting features, or just pretty much grab everything and be as aggressive as possible. And sometimes you'll need to take a middle ground approach. So what exactly is a feature? I like to think of a feature as the smallest piece of generic information that still gives you information about a sample. Uh, and it gets encoded in all sorts of different ways, but it all boils down to some sort of uh, numerical encoding. So to give some examples of uh, features uh, in the use case space, like let's talk about car insurance. Uh, it could be quite useful to know what model of car you have. Uh, if you drive a Toyota, you might be uh, somewhat more defensive than somebody driving a sports car, maybe? I don't know. I don't drive. Uh, in the image space, the color of pixels is, of course, necessary. Uh, in my original space, when I did astrophysics, uh, in black hole detection, it could be quite useful to know the galactic coordinates of the images you're seeing. If you're doing things like online food ordering, it could be quite useful to know what you ate last. Uh, I always eat Chinese food, so it only recommends me to me Chinese food. Uh, it could be differentiated by model, for example, in sequencing, such as in Henry Markov models, uh, recurrent neural networks, or LSTMs. It could be quite easily the last event state or the last few event states, depending on how much of order you want. Um, again, imaging the channels and uh, pixel data. And in reinforcement learning, it could be uh, how you encode the state, what information is in a state, and what actions map you from state to state. And finally, it's very dependent on what available data and context you have. For example, if you have geographic information, do you partition based on city, uh, town, location, state, province, country, whatever? 
uh, time series data, how do you bin, uh, depending on time, how, fi how, finally, uh, how finally do you bin your, uh, your continuous uh, time intervals. So to give a quick example, uh, this is a famous Kegel problem that was done a few years ago. It's just a simple titanic survival prediction. Uh, given the passengers, can you predict if this passenger will survive the Titanic or not? It's a little bit morbid, but hopefully I don't find anybody. Um, so how exactly do you select the features? There's so much information regarding humans, right? Like, if I was to board a Titanic, uh, let's pick something weakly correlating, like what I ate for dinner before I boarded the Titanic, or what kind of household I came from, how many people are in my family, what color shoes I wear, could be ideally um, weakly correlating features. But let's say that I, I'm using my domain knowledge and I pick these three features, the age, uh, what job the person had on the ship, and the, what tongue that passenger spoke. Then ideally, for example, if you bucket on age, you know that people that were younger were tended to be prioritized for uh, placed on lifeboats. Uh, the role is useful because you know that engineers and the captain typically go down off the ship. If you're a passenger, you're prioritized to get off the ship. And the t uh, what language you spoke could be encoded into whether they spoke English or not. You don't need to keep all the information of what ex exactly what exact language they knew because you just need to know if they understood the crew members crew members instructions. So hopefully this uh, trivial example gives you some sort of overview as to how much information there could be, why you need to select it, and um, how it can be useful in, pro in giving you information again. So let's get to the meat of the matter. How do you actually do uh, feature engineering? Well, first I'm going to define two kinds of variables, categorical and numerical, in case not everybody knows. So categorical variables are pretty much exactly what they sound like. They're just defined categories for certain things. Uh, for example, I'm going to use hair color, uh, red, green, blonde, uh, indigo, whatever, black. Uh, these, uh, these things typically tend to be discrete, but not necessarily disjoint. Uh, some categories can be combinations of other categories. Uh, they can often seem numeric. For example, uh, it's a common problem that people will look at things like serial numbers and think of them as numeric variables. And one way you can see if it's something that's numeric or categorical is understand if you take the average or subtract it from something else or add it or whatever, if it still re retains the same semantic meaning. Uh, so how do you actually send such categorical information to a model? Oftentimes, some frameworks uh, will just let you leave it as it is, and they'll optimize it for you. But if you want to use Spark ML, you can leave it as it is and encode into some numbers. So I mentioned uh, five hair colors before. So I could encode like black and blonde into one and two, and the other ones into some other, the other numbers. Uh, and you can use a string in indexer in Spark ML lib for this. Uh, you can do one-hot encoding, where it's basically for each different level you create a binary variable, uh, depending on what category it is. One of the variables is on, and all the others are off. Uh, you can also do binary encoding, which is kind of a way to compress one-hot encoding. Uh, one-hot encoding can sometimes uh, leave you with too many dimensions if your variable has high dimensionality. And binary encoding can sometimes actually have improvements over one-hot encoding, such as in decision trees. Uh, so in binary encoding, you pretty much convert the number of your category to its binary digit representation, and each of those binary digits becomes its own variable. So for example, if I encoded the color, uh, the, red, the red color of hair to like the number four, I could use the binary digit 100, and then I would have three binary, three binary features for my model. Specifically for text, you'll need to understand things like tokenization and word to vec uh, pretty much word to vec is uh, a way to represent a word as a vector, or a word or phrase as a vector, so you can add or subtract these vectors to add or subtract semantic meaning. Uh, as I mentioned, encoding is quite important for the performance of your machine learning models. Uh, as I mentioned, decision trees can often have worse performance than one hot encoding. This is because it has to uh, split based on a, on, a, on a feature, right? And sometimes, if you have too, too much cardinality, it'll do suboptimal prunes, and it'll sometimes pick a suboptimal feature than if you just left the original high cardinality feature uh, w without a one-hot or binary encoding, you just left it as a numerical feature. 
now uh, I mentioned numerical variables. So these things can be either continuous or discrete, but you can transform into a categorical variable via binning or bucketing. Uh, in the Titanic example, for, I bucketed age into young or older uh, by a simple uh, threshold. Oftentimes, you'll need to account for scaling of your variables. Uh, not all numerical variables are created equal. For example, let's say if you're trying to do nearest neighbors clustering for KNN, and for some reason one of your features was of much higher magnitude than all the other features, then that really high magnitude feature would be prioritized over all the other features and when you're trying to do minimization of distances for your clusters, which is obviously not what you want. Uh, you also need to account for scaling in different scenarios uh, for different models. For example, in neural network training, you'll often do uh, back propagation through mini batches. And in those situations, it's quite uh, standard to scale per batch instead of scaling on your entire data set. Uh, this is because you want to account for stochastic noise when you're doing sampling, and then you often add a friction term to your back propagation. Uh, some ways that people do uh, scaling is simply normalizing using C scores or max min scaling or uh, max app scaler and spark mllib. Uh, there's a bunch of estimators that let you do the fit and then the transformation. Uh, for numerical variables, it's always important to understand the relevant stats uh, so you can understand how outliers and the distribution of your numerical variables can contribute to the general process of the insight you're trying to obtain from your data. Uh, for example, if you know that it, it's right skewed for, for whatever reason, it could be useful to do a log, a log transform to bring things to a more reasonable scale. If you know your variable has high variance, and it could be that there's a noisy process behind it, and you should try to probably investigate more. Um, and this can also detail you how, I mentioned outliers, this can also detail to you if you should be using more robust objective functions to uh, get better performance. And again, specifically for words, when you're dealing with word counts, it's often useful to do uh, some sort of weighting based on the importance of those words. And a very common uh, way to do this is using TFIDF, which is also in Spark MLlib. All right, so now that some variables are defined, I'll go into the actual process. And again, I want to emphasize that you can iterate through and go back and forth and go in whatever order as you see fit. But to, go, to give an order, uh, often people start with cleaning data. And this is often just normalizing your data and stuff like that. For example, if I'm doing text prediction and I know that people, for some, whatever reason, misspell Iceland as Iceland and land, uh, clearly that carries a different semantic meaning. And if I was trying to do word prediction or word cl uh, sequence classification, it could have vastly different effects. Uh, not all data in the wild is perfect. Sometimes you'll have missing data or end outliers. Oftentimes people will just impute the data by using the mean or mode. Uh, you can get a little bit more complex by using matrix factorization methods, uh, like non-negative matrix factorization, which I'll cover later, or it's, uh, all, those, all those simple things. And usually in this step, people will convert their data to uh, also do other kinds of cleaning, which can be very simple, uh, like just encoding it. Or it can be quite difficult. For example, one of the problems I had in the past was dealing with irregularly sampled data. And when I was, when I was trying to do a four-year transform, and how do you deal with that? Uh, you can try to understand the generative process and try to impute the data using the generative process. Or you can just uh, use the Nyquist theorem, remove some samples, and lose some information to get better regularly sampled data. Then there's the actual part of selecting features. There have been great talks today about feature selection, uh, both today and the talk right before me, so uh, th they were quite good. I hope you guys saw them, and if not, I would really recommend them. But to give a little, to supplement those talks, uh, using the philosophy, you can use your domain knowledge to conservatively pick features, and that's what people typically do when they pick feature selection. I like to just pretty much throw everything at it and let the math tell me what's there and then try to understand the features. And you can do this by various different ways. You can, do, you can throw the data at a simple linear regression, see the weights, and see which features come out with the highest weights. Uh, you can use Gini coefficients. Uh, you can correlate your features with the labels and see which ones have highest correlation. You can try to do information gain by splitting and see how the labels and your features split. 
Of course, this will not be perfect because uh, with nonlinear mo non models, it will be very context dependent. Uh, get, so you need to account for these local and global gains. Finally, you can do, use things like information criteria, and this is one of my favorite methods. Uh, basically, you try out a bunch of different models where you subtract and add features as, as, as is pending. For example, you can try a model with all the features and remove one feature, and then try another model where you add that feature back, and you basically compare the uh, uh, ACIC, I think it is, how you pronounce it, information criteria and the Bayesian information criteria, which are both readily available within Spark with, for most estimators. Or you could compare the base factors, which is basically where you compare the model accuracy given all the data uh, in a probabilistic fashion. This is not in Spark, and it's actually not done often, although it should be done more often. Uh, basically, the problem here is that you need to in integrate over your entire parameter space, which makes things difficult for most people. But if you know integration, Spark will make this very easy. And as I said before, you need to account for noisy and dirty data. So you need to always understand the generative process for your data. And finally, some models don't like when features have correlation with each other. This is common in ordinarily, ordinarily squares and some exponential families. So the transformations, this is what typically people think about feature engineering, although this will probably be what you spend on your least amount of time on. You'll spend most of your time pretty much cleaning and uh, selecting your features. But once you know what you want, you typically start uh, transforming them, and that could, be, that could be adding two features together. Like, for example, if I wanted to know my weight tomorrow, it could be quite useful to know my average weight over the last few months, and that would, be, that would involve some addition and division of some features. Oftentimes, you'll need to go to a higher order and start doing polynomial regression, with, uh, sorry, polynomial functions between your features. Uh, this is quite common in uh, support vector machines with the kernel trick. Uh, some things that people lo look over are ratios and rational differences of polynomials. Uh, it's been empir empirically proven that uh, things like neural networks and support vector machines have a difficult time recreating ratios or rational differences of features given the features themselves. So just making these explicit as, a, as its own feature is often quite useful. Uh, of course, you'll need to do encoding and scaling of your numerical variables and categorical variables. Oftentimes, if your data is too, uh, if you can't bring all your data to the node or the edge uh, from the beginning, you can often use lookup tables to look up additional features. Uh, this could be lookups for to historical data from a year ago or two years ago. Um, and one thing that people tend to overlook is how do you deal with dates? Uh, dates come in all sorts of different formats, ISO, timestamp from UTC. Uh, and people often don't know what information in a data is relevant or even how to encode it. Like, for example, if you want to predict what time of day you're going to wake up tomorrow, it could be useful to know what time, the month, the, the day, hour, and minute of your previous waking times, but that might be as relevant to half the year or the second. And of course, you need to account for holidays and special events if you're dealing with seasonal, seasonal events. Uh, for example, going back to the broadband example, if we want to uh, optimize network allocation for sports viewers, it could be quite useful to know that the Olympics are coming up. Uh, and at the bottom is very minimal code, just showing how to do a one-hot encoder within uh, Spark in the Scala interface. Uh, yeah. So let's say you have everything optimal, you have your features, you've cleaned them, you've transformed them, but you have too many of them, and this leads to some problems in production that, or training that you did not see happening. Uh, for example, if you have too many, uh, too many features and you're training decision trees or gradient boosting machines or something of the sort, you can have unhealthy prunes. Uh, this is why one-hot encoding is not, sometimes not optimal for decision trees. Uh, sometimes when you have a lot of uh, features, you run into the curse of dimensionality with distances looking the same. Uh, this kind of goes to the problem that a lot of the volume of a hypersphere is on the outside. Um, and of course, if you have more features, that's just more parameters for a model to fit. So it, it can actually slow down training, which might not be a problem for you when you're doing the first batch, but what if you have to do retraining of a model in production? 
and you need to deploy that model relatively quickly. Um, so the most common technique I know for dimension reduction, it's pretty much just understanding what are the most relevant uh, directions, and this kind of goes. Uh, this really means finding the right basis vectors to encode your data, and if you know a little bit of linear algebra. Uh, so, to give a more intuitive uh, understanding, like, let's say you were trying to find or encode a bunch of points in that ellipse. And right now I gave you three pieces of information, uh, the projection onto the semi-major axis, the semi-minor axis, and that yellow line I randomly threw on there. Uh, as you guys know, uh, ellipses are two-dimensional figures, so all I need is the, those two coordinates. I don't need that third coordinate. And that's kind of what these, uh, these dimension reduction techniques tell you. They tell you which directions are the most important and how to encode them with regards to those directions. So three very common things are principal component analysis, or stochastic principal component analysis, uh, which is readily available within Spark. Uh, basically what you do is you just subtract the mean from your matrix, uh, from the covariance matrix, find the components or the directions that have the most variance for your, for your information that have the most uh, space in it. And then you just use those coordinates to uh, represent your features instead. Another way is doing the same thing, but you assume that some latent factors uh, form the basis of all your data. And that this is fitted by expectation, expectation maximization. Uh, the only issue is that I don't think this is readily supported within Spark, but people have written tons of packages for this. Uh, there's somebody from CMU wrote distributed uh, factor analysis. And lastly, a lot of people use non-negative matrix factorization, uh, which is basically when all your features are known to be non-negative, this usually uh, does really well. And this is available in Spark with uh, non-negative alternating least squares. Or you can also use uh, write your own with Poisson gamma factorization. I actually prefer this method because I'm a little bit more Bayesian than most. And lastly, you might not need to do all of this. If you have really good feature importance rankings, then just remove the features you want until you have acceptable performance. Or just tr keep transforming your features until you find something that fits. Uh, so I'll give a harder use case now that I've given all that information. This goes back to my thesis I did a few years ago. Uh, so basically, you're trying to classify stars and galaxies. Um, galaxies outnumber stars in the night sky 10 to 1. And let's say that all you had is the information of a star. All you had is a point source. You just look at it in the sky, it's a very small point, And you see its brightness. So how do you classify a star or galaxy? Well, you know that the brightness, or you didn't know, but you know now that the brightness of a star is correlated with its temperature, and stars are very one-dimensional based on temperature. With its temperature, you can know the mass, the radius, and lots of other uh, properties. You know that galaxies are composed of various stars, so they might have some sort of other uh, high, higher dimensional pr uh, feature on temperature. So what you do is you bend the temperatures into like the red range, the, the green range, the blue range, the indigo range, and all that stuff. Then you take the logarithm within these ranges, and then you form features from the subtractions of these logs, which is also just the log of the ratios. And the logarithm puts it all on, one, on a reasonable scale, and so there's no need to do any sort of scaling. So here's a graphical view of what it would look like without feature scaling in one of the bin temperatures. So I'm looking at the H band, which is somewhat more blue than red. Uh, you can see that there's very little differentiation between these plots. Although there's some pattern, there's a lot of overlap. And if you try to perform classification just based on this untransformed data with the other, ba with the other bands, you wouldn't get much a high AUC at all. You get like a 0.55 accuracy and really low precision and you care about precision because stars are vastly outnumbered by galaxies. However, if you do feature engineering, can you guys see that? I guess so. Ignore everything but the top left of both uh, segments of five graphs. So the red things are the stars and the blue things are the galaxies. Uh, and if you look at the top left of the left one, uh, that's looking at the 
the IZ and Y band, which are somewhere in the blue range, you can see that the stars form a very nice line through all the galaxies. If you look at the next one, which is the green, red, and some of the blue ranges, you can see that stars actually cluster themselves on the top right and also form some sort of uh, curve through all the galaxies. And using just basic feature engineering using and mapping these eight temperatures into eight logarithm ratios, you can go from 0.55 accuracy to 0.99 accuracy with a very high precision. So finally, I just want to impart uh, a little bit of philosophy. Uh, you might not always know what's there if you don't have too much domain knowledge, so just try a whole bunch of stats on it and see what comes out. Map things to deciles, do all sorts of categorical embeddings. If you have numerics, try all sorts of uh, categorical embeddings for your categorical variables. If you have some sort of idea of how the data should behave, then form some hypotheses and uh, test them out using statistical tests and see if those uh, if validations are true. And if that's true, just add the feature to your set and then find a transformation you need. And oftentimes in the wild, you won't know what works best, so you'll need to do a hybrid of these two approaches. And lastly, before you go, uh, these are some things that are going on. Uh, with the advances in deep learning, a lot of people are moving from feature engineering to architecture building, but I just want to say that the importance of having good data and good features is still there. A lot of the times, people are building meta features where models build features for other models. Uh, this is kind of why transfer learning kind of works. And a lot, of people, a lot of people, including myself, have built pipelines to just automate all of this. But you need to be really careful because at each depth of functions, you have combinatorial complexity when you try to do combined features. And as you stack transformations on transformations, you get exponential complexity. So even with a good cluster size, you might be running something forever. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? Thank you, Nabil. <laughs> we have about two and a half minutes. Um, there are two mics at the end of the aisle. Please feel free to walk towards it and um, pose your question. There you go. Hi, thanks for the talk. You said that um, encoding categorical features for decision trees could lead to suboptimal performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I would choose a decision tree if I have categorical features, because the decision tree can deal with categorical features. Yes, yes. And, uh, and so, and if you are going to encode it into multiple features, and then you're going to treat them independently, uh, yeah, that doesn't sound like a very good idea to do then, right? Uh, one way you can get around it and still use categorical features and uh, decision trees is often to not do that one hot encoding. Just leave it as a binary encoding or leave it as that, uh, you know, when I mentioned hair, like transform into one, two, three, and four. And then it'll do splits on larger sets of that categorical. It use higher dimensionality of that categorical variable to do more optimal splits. Does that, make, does that make, answer your question? Yeah. We have time for one more. Anybody? All right, can you go to the mic, please? Thank you. Hello, thanks very much for this really interesting talk. Do you know of any good method for automatic pinning of uh, numerical variables? Did you say automatic cleaning? Uh, automatic binning. Automatic oh, automatic binning. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of people use just deciles or quantiles or a whole bunch of things. Uh, some people see if the, the data is above the mode or medium, or is it stuck between two modes. So that's why it's really important to understand those relevant stats, because those relevant stats might inform you about how to do, or might inform you that you should actually do some sort of categorical bidding on that numerical variable. Does that answer your question? Thanks very much. Well, I think we'll end because uh, we're about to uh, go have some coffee. So please give a big hand to the informative talk by Nabil Sarwar.